Investing for positive cash flow, areas of job growth and warm weather. We're getting control of the retirement investment plan and legacy portfolio. All of this and more on today's episode of the Truth About Real Estate Investing Show for Canadians. I'm your host, Erwin Cito, landlord since 2005, realtor and coach to investors since 2010, four-time realtor of the year, 400 million, that's 400 million plus in client transactions and host of this little podcast that could. It's currently ranked number 81, uh, business podcast little, and per iTunes, and that's over the world. Um, thank you to my 17 listeners. Thank you for all the likes and subscribes and positive reviews. Five stars reviews, please, on, uh, on Apple or Spotify. Uh, we have a different podcast for you today as I am the one being interviewed by today's guest of the show, uh, Andrew Kim, CEO of Share, a technology-based asset manager of single-family rental properties in the USA with focus on landlord-friendly states of the Southern USA. After months of research and due diligence on both investing in the US and on share, I've convinced my wife, Cherry, that the risks here that we bear with the landlord tenant board with an eight month backlog just to get a hearing, uh, even if it's something as little as, not a little, but uh, non-payment of rent, uh, rent control. Um, we're only allowed to raise our rents two and a half percent here in Ontario, three and a half percent in BC. That means that inflation uh, is the risk for us to bear as landlords. Um, so, and then you combine that with the, the fact that there are better, simpler investments in the opportunities in the USA. It makes sense for us to sell some, if not all of our rental properties here in Ontario. I actually have uh, three listings coming up in the next week or two uh, for my student rental properties. Uh, on today's episode, the tables are turned. Andrew asks me all, the, all, all about the decision to invest in the USA via direct ownership of real estate. So direct ownership deserves some uh, attention and definition. Uh, Unlike what others out there are doing, a lot of influencers and uh, real estate gurus, uh, they are raising capital or OPM, other people's money, which is fine. Now this is a capitalist society. I'm a a part capitalist as well, Um, but this is different. A direct ownership means I own the property with full title. I have complete control over the house and do not share the ownership with anyone via joint venture or shares in a company It's just me, the bank, and my wife, Cherry. As always, in how our nearly two decades of investing has been, direct ownership, if done correctly, means higher returns, and that means getting ahead in life. Uh, I bear all the risk, and I keep, and more importantly, and what really happens, at least over the last 20 years or so, is, uh, is I get to keep all the upside. Worst case, I own a quality house in a quality location that I can renovate, move into, or sell. That's, you can't say the same for many real estate investments out there. This is how I've always invested. Uh, my wife and I don't take on partners. You won't see us asking for, asking people to raise capital or private lending or any bar- borrowing or anything like that. Uh, it's my belief you don't need joint venture partners is I can show anyone how to invest just like my 45 plus millionaire, multimillionaire real estate investors using a very efficient path with uh, as least stress as possible via direct ownership. I can't say it's been not stressful the last few years as an Ontario landlord. Uh, but let's not take our eye off the goal, which is uh, of every real estate investor, a comfortable, maybe even early retirement. That is uh, typically the primary goal of pretty much every investor that, that I meet. Um, with easy financing in the US available for unlimited properties, uh, the tax part I'm not worried about. Uh, I'm not an accountant, so talk to your own accountant. The worst case is uh, if you do if you do your taxes correctly, your corporate structure correctly, uh, one will only pay the same total amount of taxes, but it's just split between how much you pay. You, you have to pay some of it to the U.S. and you pay some of it to Canada. That's the worst case. I'm not paying more tax. The biggest risks to the real estate investor are removed. Uh, that's for the Ontario. Uh, that's for the for the Ontario investor. Uh, there's a whole lot less risks uh, when investing in the southern landlord friendly markets of the USA. There are risks, but there always are. Uh, but I'm choosing to invest uh, where my hard-earned money will work harder for me. Again, with a lot fewer risks and greater potential for cash flow. Uh, everyone has to do their own research and due diligence. I've done mine. I've done mine, including uh, I, I did a site tour around Atlanta, Georgia. I think I looked at eight or nine properties from the inside and out. So I was inside of them myself, uh, and I've grilled Andrew, <laughs> CEO of Share, probably more than anyone else has. <laughs> Poor guy was seated next to me on that flight home uh, from Atlanta, and there were no, there was no in-flight entertainment for him to get to hide for, hide from me for, from. Yeah, we had a, we were on a getaway Air Canada plane. 
in economy class. Just two plus hours of me asking questions. Uh, have a listen to Andrew asking me the most common questions Canadians are asking about investing in the USA. Please enjoy the show. Oh, yes. And for more information on share investing and investing in the US, uh, the website is www.iwin.sharesfr.com. Again, that's www.iwin.sharesfr.com. Mention Irwin or Iwin or that you're in the pursuit of the truth about real estate investing and they'll take good care of you. Please enjoy the show. All right, Irwin. So what's keeping you busy these days? Listing, I'm currently listing three of my properties. Um, there's no market for student rentals right now, sorry, for, for duplexes. So I'm focusing on my student rentals, which have a higher demand. So thank God I, have a, I had a diversified portfolio. So again, my plan is to sell, the timing, the seasonality is correct to be selling a student rental. So that's, I'm prepping to sell all my student rentals. So that's keeping me busy. And uh, yeah, having to talk to my clients through these difficult times of being a landlord with uh, elevated interest rates, landlord tenant boards backed up eight months just to get a hearing. And that's just to get a hearing. It doesn't mean you get a decision. Mm. So having to support clients through that, you know, having to support clients through um, challenging renovations or uh, unfortunately defective renovations. Like I have this one Yikes. client um, who bought a turnkey property, but he's got water coming into the basement. Right. bought a turnkey from the from the builder from I'm sorry a, a builder a small very small builder and then his other property the like his renovation uh his basement he suited a basement the the tenant moved out because the floor was put down on an unlevel floor so the floor is popping up in in the sharp edges on on flooring so their child who's still crawling around is too unsafe so having to coach the client through Yikes. dealing with the manufacturer and the general contractor on yeah you're like a real estate investment shrink or a therapist you know the funny thing is like when i when i actually chat gpt what a asset manager is <laughs> i was like this is what i always tried to do right right um but we can never get really to that scale that sort of um we could never have all all great vendors in each of the positions. Like for example, property managers, I've personally fired five property managers. I just fired one earlier this year for my St. Catharines properties. Um, it's just, uh, and then the tenant things is harder, right. right? With, you know, I have properties that are under rented by like $1,400, Oof. right? Cause, uh, and then for all the landlords listening, like we are subsidizing our clients' lifestyles right. and we're backstopping their housing inflation. Um, so everyone feels the same like I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, personally, I'm tired of it. Yeah. So, you know, it says it's the right season to get rid of your real estate. Why are you offloading? Right? Is it just because of the negative cash flows, head, the headache, or w w what's the driving force? Uh, so, a couple things. I want cash so that I can move that money around to better assets. Uh, want to pay down some debts, want to take some profits, want to get rid of some headaches. Because again, like two of these properties, that property manager I fired, and so it's been a bit of a headache to deal with that. Um, this is not why I got into real estate. I didn't get into real estate to be a landlord, to like, to like deal with the stresses of being a landlord. Um, yeah, and then, you know, I found opportunity in the States. Awesome. Where I can find better, honestly, better numbers on a single family home than a student rental. And then student rentals, for anyone who knows student rentals, they're difficult to finance versus I can buy properties in the States with debt service ratio mortgages, which is just a commercial, commercial apartment buildings, which is what the dream for every investor is to not have to self-qualify for property for mortgages. And I'm difficult to self-qualify because I'm self-employed and I have like seven corporations. So mortgage people hate me yeah, because they have to, they have to review like seven corporations to qualify me. And then if they can't qualify me, they just did all this work for nothing. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a manual process. There's no system for that. Oh, it's yeah. brutal. Yeah. And then like we, my wife, usually my wife has to explain to the mortgage company, like what's going on. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Cause it's, that's not easy to, to interpret all of this. Um, so yeah, I'm looking for easier, I'm looking yeah. for opportunity. Yep. 
uh, I like I've been public about it. I believe the mar- the market's going to bounce back once we see some uh, once the rhetoric once like once the rhetoric changes for the Bank of Canada, the interest rates that they're, they're at least pausing, which they've already started to yeah. allude to. Um, then we'll see properties price prices go back up, and uh, and then my my belief is that the Americans will will cut after they after we do. So that's ideal timing, I think, yeah. to be getting into like the U.S. market or Canadian market if that's your choice. It's not yeah. mine. Um, but yeah, I see other opportunities. Did you start looking down south before we met, or was that like so you were actively kind of looking? No, at- not actively. Like uh, I've had, like I've been around real estate investing since like two, I've been a landlord since two thousand five. I started getting really educated in two thousand eight, and even back then, like there was some good content around how it's easier, it's more favorable for landlords, mm-hmm. the rules and regulations in the states. But the entire time. Uh, financing readily, easily scalable financing was not available. Yeah. Up until like like all all the people I knew who were buying in the states were either doing cash like mm-hmm. hard, hard true cash, or they're using all HELOC money right. off of their home. And these are Canadians. Yeah. So they're buying like a two hundred thousand dollar house in Florida. All that money came from their HELOC. That's hardly scalable or a good use of capital, in my opinion, right. for investment purposes. So I've ignored the U.S. market. I've always been a, a fan of America, like American economy, and you know, I drive a Tesla. I never thought, I never thought I'd own an American car. Never. Like, my family had terrible experience with like Pontiacs and GM products, <laughs> so never. Like, we swore as a family we'd never own another American product car. Now I drive a Tesla. And you're wearing a USA jersey. Yeah, and wearing a USA jersey. Maybe it's made in America too. No, it's not. It's made. In <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's made in China. <laughs> but no, I never considered the U.S. Never took this U.S. seriously until until just the last few months. Okay, so I know you've been diving deep. You, we've been spending a lot of time together. You've officially joined our advisory board. We we tripped down south. Like that's fun, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was definitely a good trip. Having dinner before dinner. Um, that was awesome. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So you know, what was what was the biggest eye opener for you? Like coming in. And, and going down south, speaking to some property management companies, like what were the biggest takeaways of that trip? So even before that, first of all, was the financing piece opened up. So uh, our now mutual friend Scott Dillingham, yep. uh, because he, fo- he because he focuses on investors and, and because he's dual citizen, he was able to open up a shop in the states. Uh, at last check, he probably has more now. At last check, but he had nine lenders ready to yeah. lend. I think he's got yeah, he's about to onboard another one today. Oh, or, yeah, fantastic. So, yeah. But and every time he onboards another lender, like the terms seem to get better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that or he's searching more aggressively. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Through I'm sure you've helped guide him as well. Which lenders are more favorable? Oh, he's favorable. doing a great job. Like I'm constantly yeah. pinging him. Like uh, like I just message him like, yeah, I've got this one scenario. How can we help this one client? Nice. nice and then he's nice. just like, oh, well, they're Canadian. Let me look on this side yeah. as well as sat down south. I'm like, perfect. So Scott's coming on the show as well, so our listeners will understand better his background. But this high level, like he was the number one person at a Bay Street bank, mm-hmm. 400 units in one year, which is absolutely incredible. Right. 400 mortgages, um, and he he did he, he he got me several mortgages, tough mortgages too. Student rental mortgages, <laughs> which are tough mortgages, and I'm tough to lend to. So he's always been great to me and my clients, uh, and now he is the only Canadian broker I know of who can offer. Uh, investment mortgages for Canadians on U.S. properties. Yeah, and from what he tells me, each lender can do like ten to fifteen properties. So now I have a year. A year. <laughs> okay. So no one's going to get to that point. <laughs> Everyone's going to run out of capital way before yes. they get to their mortgage limit. We'll, we'll get them there. <laughs> <laughs> Just my experience. Most people run out of capital before they run yeah. out of mortgage room. Uh, so now, so now I can do leveraged uh, asset buying, uh, housing buying. So that's that was the first thing that. Otherwise, if that wasn't available, mm-hmm. there, I wouldn't have gone to Atlanta with you. Right. Right. Because there was no point in doing due diligence on American properties and property managers and, and share your, in yourself that without knowing that I could scale a portfolio. I could get to like a 10, 20, 30 property portfolio. Right. 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 Like that's your experience too, yep. right? Exactly. Because you, you own 20 yourself. Yep. There's no, no one, you can't do that cash, all cash. No, 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 no. Not cash. Definitely not cash. Right. Yeah. So, so then when we went to Atlanta, first off, um, 
one of the one of the REITs I invest in, they just bought a building. They don't normally buy buildings. They usually do uh, land developments, but they just bought a building in Atlanta. Oh yeah, thank you. Atlanta's good, eh? <laughs> so I so they sent me their pitch deck. <laughs> so I'm reading through and like, this all makes sense. Like I went to business school. I'm old school and a real estate investor. Like I I don't. This is not an emotional for me at all. Decision. Yep. I go I go based on job growth, economic fundamentals. Uh, is the population growing? Populations tend to grow when jobs are growing and incomes mm-hmm. are growing, and Atlanta just ticks so many boxes, right? Uh, head office to mm-hmm. 17 Fortune 500 companies, 31 head offices for Fortune 1000. Uh, I went, I took a selfie in front of the Coke <laughs> Museum, Coke, Coca Cola head offices in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, so it just it's checked so many things. Population is right. growing way faster than the national average. It's a tech hub. Uh, the airport's like the one of the biggest in the oh, world. Man, it's nuts, yeah. Yeah, so it's just jobs, 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 jobs. It's huge, huge population. I didn't know all these things. Like area populations, Greater Atlanta is like six point two million. So that's for anyone who's following. That's like fifty percent bigger than than all of Alberta. And this is just one city in America, right? Right. So, so going in, I was impressed. And then also the deals, the past deals you guys have done, I was impressed by the numbers. Uh, you know, it seemed like the ref ratio was if a property was three hundred thousand, they were in for two thousand dollars a month plus utilities, mm-hmm. single family. And then, as someone who's done a lot of renovations, I've owned over forty houses personally. Almost all of them are very invasive mortgages. I've done top ups where I've added second stories. I've done lots of basements. I've done additions. I've done full gets guts, where like, like the house is stripped down to just a brick wall, right. even the windows, no roof. Even I've taken a roof off of off a property as well. Wow. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hardcore. Wow. Yeah. Hardcore, and then versus I look at your like the shares business model, like you you call you call you call major renovations fifty grand, like yeah. have extreme major renovation fifty grand, like oh yeah, <laughs> fifty grand, you might see a stud. <laughs> fifty grand's a joke, <laughs> right? Yeah, like our our our, our for a basement apartment retail it's one hundred sixty thousand Canadian, mm-hmm. right? Which is wow. standard practice for us. For renovation, and we're st- and we're looking at uh, a hold of being vacant for like six twelve months. Oh, yeah, right. Like, yeah, how yeah. long does it take you to do a fifty thousand dollar renovation? Yeah, well, I, I think they quoted. You know, we try to deploy. Um, depends on which property manager. But you know, they internally target a thousand dollars a day, but probably closer to seven fifty to eight hundred oh. a day. A day is their target. So we're talking about so f- two months. Yeah. And that's your that's your major. Yeah, we gotta get yeah. And we we put that into the performance, so we gotta we gotta hold ourselves to that sort of velocity, right? All right. But yeah, fifty thousand. I mean, in proportion to the house price, like in a two hundred thousand dollar house, it's twenty five percent. But I guess what's one sixty to the price of one of those houses? It's a lot. Yeah. But then just put it more simply, one sixty Canadian is more than enough down payment. Yes. To get a whole house in the yeah. states. Yeah. Yeah, you could be all cash. Pretty close, yeah. Pretty close, yeah. And the objective, the objective of a real estate investor is usually they want hard assets, and there's nothing harder than land. Mm-hmm. My basement apartment doesn't come with any land. Right. If I buy a garden suite, that doesn't come with any land. Right. I buy a house that comes with land. Yeah. So everything just seems fun. Feels fundamentally fundamentally correct about owning a property in and around Atlanta. Okay. And then just meeting with the, meeting with the property managers, how they when I when I'm telling them my story, <laughs> properties are six hundred grand. It's like what world do you live in? Oh yeah, what world do you live in? Because <laughs> um, you know, we as Canadians joked how ignorant Americans are to us. I'm just equally ignorant to them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so 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 for them to hear about like us having like million dollar duplexes or triplexes, and then for for us to tell them like eight months in the landlord tenant board to for non payment of rent. Yeah. Just to get a hearing. Like this is all foreign to them. The yeah. price points, uh, the amount of capital you have to shell out, uh, the tenant rights, uh, we have rent control, which they don't have. Right. Right? Every all this was foreign to them. Yeah. So to them, this is like the worst this this investment makes no sense. Right. 
my yeah. investments make no sense. Yeah, yeah. Right. What I currently hold. <laughs> yeah. So then, what do you what do you say to like other Canadians? Then, like, there, uh, oftentimes when we speak to Canadians, there's so many looming questions and so many gray spaces. They're like, well, I can't physically go touch and see my property, mm -hmm. or you know, what are the tax implications? So, what do you say, firstly, to you know, the proximity question mm -hmm. of not being able to kind of touch and feel, see, put eyes on their property? Well, that was the point when I went down to Atlanta. I need to get a taste of feel. Like I get to see some properties, thanks to you setting up those meetings with the property manager, showed us around different properties. I thought it was hilarious that they showed us the really, really nice properties first. Because that's, <laughs> that's classic realtor. Right. Show them the nice properties first, yeah. and then like let us slide. But we always, <laughs> but we were constantly on them. Like, yo, I want to go see uh, yeah. what a bad property to you is or a bad neighborhood. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, we walked in that neighborhood, like this isn't a bad neighborhood. Yeah. Like yeah. I can walk here freely. So, yeah. but sorry, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Like 3,000 square foot, brand new house, yeah. never been lived in, 390 grand, Quarter humongous lots. lot. Yeah. Right. Like these 3,000 square foot, brand new and like, you know, stone, countertops and stainless steel and yeah that one, that one was a bit of much though yeah they but they're so cheap yeah and they all and it was funny because we we're telling the americans this would be 1.5 back home yeah <laughs> if we listed for, for this price we'd have 30 offers yeah. <laughs> in like two hours yeah. that was a pristine house that was a bit overkill yeah. though but yeah, yeah. I, I hear you but, so so yeah proximity um i think to each their own uh i've seen people proximity invest and i've studied i've um like I live and breathe real estate. Mm -hmm. So anytime there's been like a massive failure in something, I study it. Uh, Cause that's what we did in business school. We, we learned via case study. Right. Right. So I kind of like uh, each massive failure to me is a case study. What went wrong? What did they do? So for example, in the case of like Epic Alliance, I know you're not familiar with them, but that was a, that was a, I think that was like over 200 properties and more, largely even Saskatoon. Right. So what went wrong? So small town, and then just a simple Google Street View, just walk, just drop walking around the virtually walking around the neighborhood. You see, like cars were not nice, like uh, windows were boarded up. This is not a good area, right? Right. But that was enough for me to say this is not good. And what else did they do wrong? They used the same appraiser. The, the vendor chose the just chose the same appraiser to appraise all the houses, right? A bank would never let you do that, right? It has to be third party. Mm. You can't. They can't be influenced. Gotcha. Right. You need a third party home inspection. So I have clients uh, that do that allow us to write offers and then they come for the home inspection. So I'm down with that. Right. And then I've been around long enough that I can run my own comparables, both for price of property and rents. Right. I've already been back check fact checking you guys on your rents, <laughs> on your prices and rents. Right. And so I can do it. I would, and I, I have enough comfort now that I would do it. I wouldn't have to see the property. Cherry might make me fly down, make me fly down before the closing, at least for the first or second mm -hmm. property, but that'd be sufficient. Yeah. Because again, uh, I look at, I've been around a long time. You know, we've done over 350 transactions. I forget what the number is 400 million worth of real estate we've transacted in just in book value. So I have a lot of experience. So when I talk to clients, like I always tell them, your number one risk is the tenant in Ontario. Number one risk is the tenant. And when I look at property, when I go see a property, the first thing I do is I don't do what realtors do. I do what investors do. I go straight to the basement because that's where all the problems are, right? Uh, you can see the, if the electrical is any good. You can see if the foundation is broken or water damage, right? Uh, and then I literally have had how many? I might have had two houses with frozen pipes personally, and that's the massive damage. Yeah. So now, but we're buying Sunbelt states, right? right. So temperatures don't get it below zero. So frozen pipes is removed as a risk. There's no basements in Sunbelt states. So I've removed that risk. Bad tenants I'm being told from, from the property manager. So I've spoken to the property manager myself. They're gone in 30, 60 days mm -hmm. at, at, at worse. Yep. Right. So I've removed so many risks already. Right. Yep. And there's no rent control. Yeah. So I've removed another risk. I've removed an inflation risk. Right. Now I just benefit from inflation by holding an art asset. So then... I can do it. Yeah, I don't think everyone can, which is why people still buy local, which I I appreciate. Yeah, right. Um, but everything you'll get more comfortable as things go. I was literally telling a, a hands-on investor yesterday. You know, uh, he's saying how I don't feel comfortable right away, like buying a property, right, like, which is funny because he was just complaining to me. 
how he did, how he had a sewer backup and he had to rip up the floors himself <laughs> and take oh, off the gosh. trim, take off doors, right? He's, he's just telling me like how much a headache he wants. He doesn't want that headache anymore. I'm like, you know, <laughs> there is an answer. Yeah, yeah. And and then also appreciate that that problem was in the basement of a duplex, right? Right. And that duplex was built in the 1950s, so the our drainage systems are, are failing. Our sewer systems are clay, so they're failing. They need to be replaced. And also, you've doubled the occupancy of a property. So that's another risk. Yeah, that's also 1950s property versus like the Atlanta property I keep talking about as an example. That was built in 1988. Right. And again, it has no basement. Yep. So it's just way less risk. Yeah. So again, holistically, everything just seems easier. Right. So I understand that people think it's a risk not to be able to see and touch it and be able to drive to it. But then if you stack it up against all the other risks, all the things that you've de-risked, mm -hmm. I think it makes sense. Yeah. And then like on, so the proximity part, like, you know, having a good property manager and then a great asset manager, like how, how would you, from your interactions, that your minimal interactions with uh, one of our, our preferred property management partners is like, do you see a difference in sort of approach, strategy, protocol, the methodologies yeah. that they use with any sort of uh, equivalent here? The first off is like, because when I talk to you, it's hilarious because your context of here is like, we have very different contexts. Like, you know, wait, you're, how long have you owned property in the States? Oh, over 10 years. Okay. So you've been over 10 year investor, yeah. currently hold 20 properties in the States. Yeah. Right. You know, I've been landlord almost 20 years. So our contexts are very different. Right. And it's hilarious when we talk to each other because we're almost talking different languages. Because <laughs> yeah. I remember when I told you, uh, uh, property managers will still charge you rent if no rent's coming in. Yeah, I still don't get that. I still don't get right. that. That's interesting. Okay, that that was that right. was a that was a big tidbit for me. Right, that's a big tidbit. Yeah, because in the states, that's the market. As yeah. in default, if there's no rent coming in, the property manager's not charging you fees. Mm -hmm. Now they're losing money. They're feeling the same pain you are. Right, so they're intrinsically motivated to. No, that's extrinsically. They're extrinsically motivated, financially motivated to keep your place rented. Right, and also they're doing your renovations, so that they're motivated, financially motivated, to get the renovation done, get it tenanted. Yeah. Right. So that they can collect PM fees, the monthly yeah. fees, which is what they want. Yeah. Versus here in Ontario, if a PM didn't collect fees when you weren't rented, they'd go bankrupt. Right. And many have. Right. They can't assume all the financial risk, the same risk that we assume as landlords. <laughs> <laughs> Do the PMs here often like? Do the project management component of any sort of rentals and constructions? Yes and no. Like the challenge I've seen with many property managers here is that generally they're small. Mm -hmm. They're mom and pop shops. And I've seen and and many of them are new entrants as well. Right. Like they're so the challenge I've always seen is people who get into construction who've never been in construction. Like say you went from working from a, a corporate job to now you're now in construction. Like the communication between people in a corporate environment is very different than trades people. <laughs> right. It couldn't be more different. Right. Because I remember back when I was in corporate, you write an email, if you don't like the response, you CC their boss, right? And you CC your boss. Yeah. And then things start moving better. And then if things are really bad, CC the next person's boss. Yeah. Right. And then you always get action. You don't get that with tradespeople. <laughs> right. See ya. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, and then the situation just gets worse. Right. Like, um, like the labor issues worsening as in people retiring. There's, it's hard to find good trades. Right. So it's a tough, tough business. So you're combining people that aren't used to working in construction, working with trades, and the labor pool of trades is just thinning. Right. So it's not easy. So, and what I'm trying to get to is that I've seen PMs fail quite poorly at delivering uh, renovations, but also consider the fact that our renovations are much larger in scale. Right. Right. Because right. we're usually doing, we're often doing a full cosmetic on the upstairs above grade, and often we're doing, we're finishing a basement in the basement. Mm -hmm. So that can mean putting in a bathroom. So that means putting in new plumbing. You have to put in new rough ins. If we're putting in the kitchen, more rough ins, right? So again, we're talking about a basement apartments under sixty thousand versus your major renovations fifty thousand American. Right. That, like, we're talking about our projects are twelve months 
versus you're talking about two months. Right. There's a very different capital outlay and risk comparison. Right. Right. Because people need to they never forget your biggest risk as a landlord is vacancy, like negative cash flow. Right. So if I'm only holding a property two months for a renovation, but I'm probably getting a good equity lift, yeah. then I can live with that. Right. Versus a, a year. Yeah. That's if a things go smoothly, assuming that you don't have to, f- assuming the, the contractor doesn't walk away, which mm-hmm. does happen, right? Or they have staffing issues or it goes over, like, pretty much they all go over, over budget, uh, over time, over budget. So very different risk profiles. Right. Interesting. Right. Okay. Now sort of switching gears, the next biggest sort of question and big black box we get a lot from Canadians or that have, are considering going south is the taxes, right? Like, yeah. It's complicated here. It's high here, and now you've got state and federal tax down south. How do you how do you kind of walk them off the ledge, or at least guide them through a dark forest? I I this is a regular piece of advice I give on the show. One of the best wealth hacks in the world is to marry your accountant, <laughs> right? So uh, I did that, uh, but that was out of love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love for what real estate. <laughs> I make holistic decisions, man. <laughs> so uh, efficient, efficient, exactly. <laughs> so unfortunately, because I married my accountant, my mind tends to shut off anything when any time accounting comes up. And uh, like, again, I have the team that can handle it. I'm not worried about it. Like the absolute worst case is that my tax is no different, mm-hmm. right? Obviously, there's more fees, but that's okay, right? Because. Um, I plan, plan on building a 10, 20 property portfolio that will positive cash flow and pay for my fees. Right. Yeah. Right? So I think that's the biggest thing that people need to consider is that you need to, you know, if, if you're buying for investment like I am, you need to own a couple properties to make this make, make sense. Yeah. Right. And then my corporation, because this is, I think it's important, like my corporation, like I already have wills written for my corporations. So one of my corporations will own the U.S. entity. So that my 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 uh, estate planning is all is still consistent, right? So I'm not too worried about it. Again, the worst case is I uh, I pay the same amount of taxes I normally would, right? Right. So I think people need to consider that. Worst case, you're paying the same amount of tax, right? It just may be split between two different governments, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So like you know, you once you're liquid, what is your sort of deployment strategy? What kind of house are you going to look for? What kind of regions are you going to look for? Do you have a preference or strategy in mind? Uh, red Sun Belt states, uh, again, based on my due diligence of yourself and Dimitri, like Dimitri is a wizard, right? So I'm largely going to defer. I'm at this point now, I'm ready to defer, right? Uh, so like my criteria is largely like I'm good for renovation. I like equity uplifts. Mm-hmm. Um, and also my plan is to diversify. I want some higher cash flow properties and I want some higher equity plays. Right. Right. Like. Like I'm, I'm, I've already planned a trip to Austin, Texas, for example. For my research, Dallas and Austin, for example, are probably two of the best places for investment yeah. in the world, right? So I probably want I probably want one each. Yep. But they'll have different return profiles, which I understand. For sure. Uh, I have plenty of trip to Memphis. <laughs> yeah, we got to get down there. Because someone tells me seven caps grow on trees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we've got to get them there, but we'll, we can find them there for sure. Uh, and actually, I think that that that, that, t- that deserves some spending some time on. Um, like Memphis, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to share. <laughs> I've just had too much good, too many people recommend Memphis to me. Hmm, interesting, All right? And then like you've shared that it's a good, really, really good cash flow play. Yeah. But because we're talking about a price point under two hundred thousand American, I can easily afford a property there, and afford properties elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Right, so I probably want one around Atlanta. Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm at a candy show, store. Yeah, I probably want one in Phoenix. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, because Taiwan Semiconductor is building a, yeah. a forty billion dollar micro uh, microchip processing plant. Yep. In Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, I can already envision. Yeah. Taking some trips to the states, paid for more by my properties. Yeah. What what what's your sort of counter argument to investing in neighborhoods that are kind of potentially bordering, you know, dangerous neighborhoods or, you know, crime neighborhoods, but 
are showing early signs of good economic fundamentals? Like, that's got to be an, a common question, right? I invested in Hamilton, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like, yeah, Hamilton like 15 years ago, right? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And look at it now. I've invested in, we've, I've helped clients invest in areas where they used to have street walkers. Right. Right. So, and also those houses were like 100 years old. Right. Like, we're not talking about that here. No. And also my plan is to pretty much almost never see my properties. Mm -hmm. So as long as the, as long as there's, several property managers who are willing to work with it and happy to work with it, I'll do it. Right. Because, for example, in Hamilton, I'll speak to my property managers. Will you manage this? If they say no, it's no. Yeah. Right? And it's not just no for me. Like, I need, like, three property managers because I need that level of redundancy. Right. Right? So if they tell me no, that's a red flag you probably shouldn't yeah. own the property. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good proxy, right? Like, if there's a number of property management companies in an area saying willing to say yes to manage a property because yeah. they're often local they know the local area yeah. they are locals yeah. so that's yeah it's often a good proxy so if we're saying we've got redundancy then that should show some signals that um, also that there's a lot of investment dollars there as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. like yeah. one of my property managers in Hamilton is an ex beat cop wow okay so he knows buildings very well yeah I had a friend with a challenging building 30 unit on main, on the main one of the main streets in Hamilton, that said, uh, "Hey, trying to refer you some business." Yeah, he's like, "I've been to that many building many times. I don't, <laughs> I don't want it." Oh, really? So that's like uh, absolute red flag. Yeah, that is. But this is the level of diligence I do. Yeah. Right. Like, versus my friend who bought the building probably didn't. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's always good to do that. Like, as much as we thrive to be a technology company, we still have boots on the ground that mm -hmm. we gut check ourselves with so you know, we get our local PM and agent to kind of say mm -hmm. oh you're not out for lunch yeah this is a good area I think mm -hmm. this, is, this is great mm -hmm. um, we've done so many clients doing leasing here and selling investment properties so yeah it's a good area yeah so yeah to use highlighting the PM as a proxy is a, is a good is a good way of looking at it because I think people generally uh, people generally understand based on we've already removed so many risks now, now to me, the, and I've I've, drill, I've grilled you on this. Mm -hmm. After all those other risks that we've that we talked, we've already de-risked. Now the next biggest risk is the property manager. Right. Right. What if they fail? Because yep. again, I I fired at least five, maybe six now. Right. Yep. So what what? Like yeah. these these guys are big. Yeah, they're big. So we you know that's the beauty of kind of the way our model works is we sign master policies, so they just service share and we're one line, but we bring a portfolio. So they don't want to screw up the portfolio, so we pull the whole portfolio from them and bring it to another big PM company. So there, that's the threat and sort of service level that we get as an institution, and then we kind of dissect that all into individual retail investors mm -hmm. on our back end. So and all of our contracts are non-sticky, so we can do 30, 60 day termination notice mm -hmm. on the PM and bring in a redundant or a backup. Mm -hmm. um, so that's. In every area, we've got at least two or three large players mm -hmm. uh, ready to go. Mm -hmm. And large players, like, they have hundreds of doors in the area. Uh, yeah, if not thousands, and across the nation, probably like twenty to 50,000 plus. Right. Like, they're large institutions. Right. Yeah. Which is weird for a Canadian because they don't exist for us. Right. Unless it's commercial, right? Like. Oh yeah. So actually, yeah. I was talking to investors. Like, I was telling like, yeah, we're. <laughs> it's funny because uh, he's a he's a builder. He's, mm -hmm. he's building uh, apartment buildings for rent, which is wonderful. And we're talking about institutional uh, property manager. And I said, you know, there's none here unless it's, they, they only exist to manage their own portfolio. He goes, no, I got one. It's this. And like, okay. And I Google him. Oh, sounds fantastic. He goes, oh, but you, you need to have 100 doors or else they won't work with you. Right. Like, okay. <laughs> Mom and pop don't have 100 doors. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what, uh, what I want Canadians to appreciate is, is that large, scalable property managers exist in the States yeah. and it's beyond our context. We've never seen it before. Yeah. Right. And then, then bring it down to like the micro level, like meeting Tim, who is showing us around. Yep. Tim is the, uh, the boots on ground property manager, your traditional property manager that we know of in, in, as Canadians. Like he is well dressed, well groomed. He's walked around with an iPad and it's like, and he had everything at his fingertips yep. via the iPad. Oh, uh, what 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 are the rents? And you just wipe, just yep. touch some buttons on his phone on his iPad. And it was this. Oh, uh, what was the renovation? He goes, and just goes through. Yep. Like, 
it was this. We just quoted this, and then we ended up this, and we're and like, and like we're doing the floor, touching up the paint, like five six thousand dollars. It'll be done in two weeks. Yeah. Like, oh, great. And then like, <laughs> that was hilarious. Was, but we the the stone guy was late. <laughs> right. He, he, they didn't have they didn't have the the stone for the countertop for the for the bathroom. Yeah. So uh, we took five extra days. Yeah. Okay, but he sounded he sounded disappointed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know they have a met- we have we uphold a metric, right? Like we want they have to be able to deploy their teams to do so much, a uh, certain amount of dollars a day, and then that backlogs everything, right? Mm-hmm. It's like a medical office where one person's late and it has a ripple effect. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he's in charge of all the construction team, so he, those are hiccups. And then he's got to redeploy the team to a different project. My word. Yeah. So Versus, that, yeah. That's all custom software that they're doing all these logistical planning. It's it's quite the operation. Versus almost all my projects need to, need a home need a inspe- uh, bylaw inspector. Oh. Right. So you're they their schedule. always find something interesting. Either live by their schedule, and they always they seem to like to make our lives difficult. Mm. Right. I had I literally had a home inspe- uh, a bylaw inspector. So first off, I appreciate that they that I need to have a third party evaluate my stuff. But then when they throw in stuff that you don't need, like for example, like uh, you need a you need a peephole on the apartment door. Mm. Like where in the building code says I need that? Oh, I just think you need it. I think you should have it. He's like, uh, and then he wanted like this hot water uh, um, for my hot water tank, uh, a hot water regulator so that doesn't go over a certain temperature. I'm like where in the building code does this exist? He goes, mm. oh, I think just think you should have it. Modern code has it, but. Uh, you have the one you have it too. Basically, they didn't really know the codes, right? But they're just just being a pain in my ass, right? For and then when they're biased, it's even worse. Like, oh no! Like they live in the area. Like this area doesn't need more rentals, and then just make your life. Oh gosh! Right? Yeah. So this is what I think investors need to appreciate is that when you have complicated renovations that require inspe- city inspections, there's more risk. Right. There's gonna be more delays. More delays mean more costs, right? If they're real pricks, then this will take you one more. This could take you once more, right? Yikes! Right? Versus we're talking like your like if it, your shares renovation, your strategy is all cosmetic. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, what do we have to do to get to the highest rents? Essentially, is the math, the basic math yeah. there. It's all cosmetics. Maybe you need an electrical permit. Yeah, but those are the easiest permits. Yeah, you don't have to go through the city for them. That's my experience. Yeah. So yeah, we, we try not to do some anything like massively invasive. Um, it ha- like ideally, the scenario is that it's still livable mm-hmm. prior to our renovation. So that's and if it's not, then we've kind of got to go a special mm-hmm. financing route. But mm-hmm. that's for another day. And then the funny thing about the show is I've had you know I don't even know what episode we're on. We're probably around about three fifty. So I've had many investors on the show. And, but I've noticed a trend, especially for Ontario investors, is if they've been around for a while, they may venture off into something really aggressive, like development or something. A whole bunch of them regress to something much simpler. Like I literally have one friend who wants to only buy pre-construction and not rent it out. Hmm. <laughs> like, it'll be heavy cash, but he doesn't want a tenant. <laughs> okay. His plan will be to, like, to exit it like a year or two afterwards. Mm. Because he'll have a unique property, because none other prop, none other, no other unit in the building has never been lived in. Right. But point is, he does not want the risk or the grief of a long-term tenant. Yikes. It's that's an, that's an extreme case. Mm-hmm. But also, I've, I know plenty of people who've done who are like uh, my path, done very aggressive inner renovations, and now are simplifying. Like my next property will be a single-family home. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm kind of at that point. Right. My next, next investment will be a single-family home. Right. Right. And actually, that's one of the questions that came up. Uh, I post a question. I asked. I, I post on my Instagram. If you want to ask me questions, ask me questions. Mm-hmm. So, it's actually a good question for yourself as well. Uh, why not multifamily? Why not apartment buildings? Why single family home? Yeah, I mean that, that's the you know long going ongoing debate between single family and multifamily. Um, you know, f- for one, multifamily is at a much more higher price point to get into. Um, we're, we're talking like. Let's go say four, four units onward. Um, it's a higher price point to get into, and it often requires different financing strategies. Um, I'm not a guru in, in sort of the retail investment of multifamily, but I know there's a lot of strategies with JVs and syndicating deals and having to kind of raise your financing to get into the house. 
Um, so you know we believe single family is an easier entry point, and it's and it's a safer one because now you can just kind of save for your own investments and get into it. And then, but yes, but a multifamily on a per unit basis might be cheaper. Um, but you don't get the diversification you could get on a single family. Um, so as you kind of deploy beyond more than one region, so that one multifamily still, although you have multiple doors and you're hedging against other tenants, you're still beholden to those local microeconomic um, issues, whether that's you know the job growth, population growth, or lack thereof, any bylaws that might be passed. Mm -hmm. You know, like is a multifamily within Ontario better than? you know, three single families across the country of Canada. Um, you know, I don't, I would say that you don't really get the same diversification you would in that single, in the multifamily in Ontario that you would if you said, I want to go Alberta, East Coast, whatever it might be. Um, so we do think that there's a way more of a hedge. Um, and as we kind of build out the single family rental market, the margins are actually turning out to be better um, with a lot of these new property management companies coming up these institutional players that we're helping unlock is turning out to be better. And, um, you know, Dimitri is probably the best person to talk about this, but their property management fees structure is a bit different. Uh, and I'm, this is talking the U S now, they don't, the, their cap rates and PM fees are, are a bit separated. The PMs, uh, fees are, uh, responsible for a little, uh, different scope and you still have to pay additional fees. Like I think you have to pay a salary, you have to pay marketing and so forth and so on. So that really chews at your NOI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so over time, your SFR NOI is a lot better. Single family rental, SFR? Yes, yep. sorry, single family rental is uh, better over time. So that's, that's a wonderful way to explain it. Yeah. Because I think we're all in it for ROI. Yeah. <laughs> so better, then I usually want to start my, that's where I'll start my investigation. Yeah. Now, now, for myself, I've been around a long time. I have a lot of friends who do apartment buildings who are really successful doing so. It's a lot of work to be yeah. good at it. Mm -hmm. Back to my friend who bought the apartment building that my property manager won't manage. He was buying retail. He was buying off, off realtor.ca, right? Because he wasn't in the community. He, didn't, he wasn't playing the long game, right? He just raised some money, bought off realtor.ca. So he was overpaying. Yeah. Right, and also this was a deal that was picked over by everybody, as in like nobody else took it, right? Because that's the reality of apartment buildings in, in my experience, is that the realtor, the listing agent for the for the for, sorry, first off, the owner of the building has likely shopped it to all their friends, mm -hmm. and then if that doesn't work, now they bring it to a realtor. Now the realtor has shopped it to their all their private clients, because they want to double end it, yeah, pocket deal, right? That fails. Now it goes. Now it gets public listed. Right. Right. So all these people already said no to the deal, and now now retail investor thinks you can make a you can make a run out of this. Right. Right. You're already you're you're already you're paying more than anybody else was was willing to pay, so already your risk is higher. Yeah. And on a building that more than nobody else wanted, so there's something wrong with it. Yeah. Versus like my friends who are successful doing this, you know, they're 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 at the golf course. Like the high-end golf courses, they're at the community meetings for that that are meant for those uh, like the Hamilton District Department Association, for example, Old Boys Club. Like they're at the those dinner at those dinner tables, right? Long game, right? Like that's the path to being. From what I observed, that's yeah. the path to being a successful apartment building investor. Right. I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And then even still, like you're still a retail investor because you still need to build out your team. Realtors, engineers, property managers. And if you screw it up, you are ruined. Right. Right. So like there's literally a sto the story on the front page of Hamilton Spectator. A gentleman, uh, it's public information. His name is Dylan Souter. Like he had a building where the pipe froze and flooded part of the, part of the property. It's now 90% vacant. Right, so the pipe freezing is no fault. I don't know. Yeah, and these properties are old. Yeah, a lot of these buildings are 100 years old. Right. So, how do you recover? You're 90 percent vacant. Right. Maybe insurance pays for it, but again, like, it's probably a massive deductible. Yeah. Anyways, the point is that I'm very risk adverse. I've always invested in small residential because it's very it's a very liquid piece of real estate. Right. Right. Because uh, if it's a single family home. That'll sell faster than an apartment building. Yeah, like I, I, 
to reduce risk, you want a liquid asset. So that's why I've stuck with this path. And also, it takes to me, it's just so much time and effort to build a solid team. Yeah. Right. I'm just so anal. You know, I have Asian parents. <laughs> that whole philosophy that someone there's always someone better. So when you have that philosophy, like you're always trying to find a better realtor, always a better property manager, like yeah. it's exhausting. Yeah. Right. No different than being a child of an Asian parent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so getting started, you know, like a lot of, um, again, the Canadian, I'm going to just hit you with all the Canadian hurdles. Sure. Um, you know, there, there's the tax piece, which we covered the proximity piece we covered. Now, what do you say about the Forex and the exchange rate with Canadians, you know, with Canadian dollar, US dollar? How do you address that? It's like, well, I'm buying this house at this price, but with this exchange rate, how do I, how do I address that? Is that now problem, tomorrow problem? How do you, how do you look at that? The way I look at it is, I find the first challenge is that people need to under study more what the U.S. economy is like. So some high level statistics. Uh, you and I were discussing before before we were recording. Like Canadian household debt is about a third larger mm -hmm. than Americans household debt. Uh, our productivity, a Canadian is only 70% as productive as, uh, as an American, right? The Americans are investing trillions into bringing manufacturing back to the States. So the way I see it from a macro level is that we're going to be buying more and more products directly from the Americans, the value add products. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if we're all buying, if the whole world, not just us Canadians are buying more American products, that means their currency is going to get more expensive. Yeah. So to meet today, so that means today I'm, I should anticipate the currencies, the U S dollar should appreciate over time against the Canadian dollar. And if anyone just looks back 10 years, the American dollar is kicking the crap out of almost every currency. Yeah. Right. Like Japanese yen, Euro, Chinese yuan. Like what other currencies want people like uh, the British pound? So that's the trend already. And again, we're going to be buying more American going mm -hmm. forward. So more Teslas, more Teslas. Yeah. Right. And there's still the there's still the the country the world currency. They're still way ahead of everybody else. And again, I'm I'm essentially going to be, going to be dollar cost averaging when I'm buying houses. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just converting everything now, right? Like no one can predict anything. So dollar cost averaging is always seems to be widely advise, advisable to do buy over time. Yeah. What's your perspective on timing? You know, like everyone's like, oh, it's an interest, high interest rate environment. Where's the economy going? What, what do you say to that? But I guess both sides of the border, or does it change for you um, now that you're pretty well versed on the US side? Is it the same narrative that or same response you'd give to someone locally versus the US? Like say they had, two deals that they could both pencil today. They can pencil a Canadian deal? I don't know. I want to see it. Maybe maybe somehow, creatively, if it could pencil in year one. I want to see it. Yeah. I want to see it because uh, I was chirping a really close friend of mine, so I'm allowed to chirp him. Uh, has a fourplex in Hamilton. I go, what's the cap? It was 8.2. I'm like, that's amazing. What do you got for vacancy? He said 2%. <laughs> now for... Now for um, I, I personally, when I when I say vacancy, I lump in bad debt, okay, right, or, or non-payment of rent. Okay, he said two percent, eh? Two percent, eh? And like, and if, the ten, and if the ten doesn't pay you, he goes, yeah, 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 I know. I probably have to pay him like ten, twenty-five thousand to leave, right? So that number, that number, that potential expense isn't in, in the pro forma, right? And then the next question is, what does it look like ten years from now? Because yeah. we have rent control. So I my challenge is, can anyone really pencil a deal here? Right. They may pencil it for in the context of an Ontario deal, but like literally, I was at a conference where someone was pitching Florida properties, and I went to one of my one of my friends with like he's got like his fund has like 12, 15 apartment buildings. I go, hey, I just like those numbers on a Florida property, right? Because they're like five caps, mm -hmm. right? You can't find an apartment building five cap. You can't like when you buy it, mm -hmm. and and I know what they do. It's like a five. 10 year strategic, um, whatever they call it, to get that property to a seven cap. Right. Versus I can immediately, I can be in a five, seven cap within a few months right. in a single family home in the States in a, in a area with strong fundamentals. Yeah. Arguably better than, better fundamentals than 
most stuff here in Canada. Right. Right. Especially in terms of job growth. Like you can't even, it's not even comparable. Mm-hmm. Right. Because those job growth stories, like that property for the same job growth story, it has to be in either Woodstock. I think it's Woodstock. Not Woodstock. Uh, I think it's Woodstock. Oh, let's say Windsor. Windsor for sure, because they're getting an EV battery plant. Mm-hmm. Right. So we have so few options here, but it's even still a single family home in Windsor probably starts at $400,000. Yeah, Canadian, it's expensive. Right. And you still have to duplex it. So yeah. another 160,000. So then just again, side by side, it's, it's a pretty easy decision for me. Mm-hmm. Um, now your question was around economy. Again, people need to go dig into what the U S economy is doing and it's phenomenal. Yeah. Right. Like again, already I mentioned like the American is more productive than we are yeah by quite a bit so just if you look at the two economies it's it's, um, because the americans already had their financial crisis they already had their massive housing correction they've already learned their lessons mortgages there are 30-year fixed yeah right which is hilarious because people don't really understand that means here like i just took i did reread that (laughs) i had to go chat gpt it like they've signed their they've locked in their rate for 30 years yeah and that's the norm yeah, I remember I was asking Scott Dilling, I'm like, can you get a variable? He goes, I'll have to try to find one. <laughs> I'll have to try to find a lender that will do it. Yeah. Right? Versus us Canadians, we've, we've actually, in, we've taken a lot of risk yeah. by doing five-year mortgages and variable mortgages. Yeah. And then we make it spanked for it here. Yeah. So again, for economy, like, again, I take a long-term view. There's no way that we, that Canada, Ontario, BC, any of it, that there's an economic story beat a top 10 town in the States. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I often, you know, to kind of add on that, it's, you know, like you look at the average home price in the U S like 2006, we're talking pre bubble pop. Right. And then you tech at hold it for 10 years, 2016, that average price almost doubled. Right. So like, and I know that's a very macro lens, but it bounces back and this is a long-term hold. This is not a short-term play. You will get your appreciation if you hold at the right time. Um, but in terms of like down market, I'm always of mind where, look, this is some of the highest interest rate environments we've seen in a very long time. Mm-hmm. And if a deal pencils today, it will definitely be lucrative in a few years, three, five, ten years time. So if you can lock it in, uh, just because inventory is still scarce, they're not producing enough at the, at the rate of rental demand and growth is in the U.S. So lock it in today. Get your thirty-year fix, so we can do the the math on on the ten-year, mm-hmm. um, and also you know the resiliency of the rental product is you know this is where it plays strong in the down market, you know in a down market rental demand ticks up, everyone needs a place to live, so at least we're signing long-term leases, 12, 24 months. Mm-hmm. You can ride that cash flow if you need to ride, raise it, you can raise it, mm-hmm. um, and then in a good market, then the house price just goes up, you know, so you have that resiliency and that liquidity options. So yeah, I, I, I'm of the mind where it's like, yeah, if you real estate is your play and you want to get in, you can't time the bottom. And if you do time the bottom and everyone else is coming in at the same, like, you know, institutions have war chests, they're ready to come in. Um, but if you miss that down, like the bottom and interest rates start dipping and interest starts coming back in, you're, you're going to miss out. You know, you're going to miss your opportunity to get some good A, B, C class product. Um, and you're going to have to pay a premium on it. Yeah, I don't like doing that. Yeah, I do. I like I. buying things on sale. Yeah, and so it's like, you know, it's it, and it's funny because we look at these performers and we will present them and it's like year one, two kind of looks a little flat, but then it gets aggressive. But it's positive. Yeah, it's positive and then in 10 years it gets really positive, right? Mm-hmm. So It's positive in an eight, nine interest rate environment. Yeah, and then, you know, we'll, we'll drop in a refinancing and, you know, accelerate that cash flow and expand your portfolio. Right. So, but yeah, it's um, it's often a, a big question, you know, for Canadians. Of, I feel like the Canadians are way more conservative than um, a lot of the Americans, which is why we always say that this <laughs> single-family asset in the U.S. is actually a very Canadian investment. Yeah. So, the Canadians are funny though, because I, 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 I'm always hesitant to say it because I know I, I fear what the response is. I always say I buy in red states. Yeah. Right. Like oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like you know what? <laughs> like we 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 even though we're conservative technically in Ontario, like yeah. on the American spectrum, it's not conservative, right? 
my point is like, do you really, if, as you're, if you're an entrepreneur, you're a real estate investor, do you really want to be investing somewhere where there's rent control? Right. Right. So I don't care what political spectrum. These are, these are investment decisions. Yep. Right. And then back to the economics point, like my theory is that even Bank of Canada is saying it, as soon as they cut rates, you're going to see housing prices go up. Yep. So that'll be true here in Canada. That'll be true in the States. Yep. Like Barbara Corcoran has been saying it as well. Yeah. The Fed just paused raising rates for two consecutive sessions now. Yeah, and the stock market's rallying. Yeah. And the bottom market's tanking. Yeah. yeah. So, again, no one knows for sure. But I actually think last week may have been the bottom of the market. Yeah. Right? It'd be interesting. Like the five year, the, the, the fixed rates in Canada are coming down. So they're doing, they're, they're going to stimulate the real estate economy. Sorry, the, the real estate market. My point is, is that um, interest rates are high now. It's a buyer's market, many markets. I can lock in my price mm-hmm. now or the next six months. And I'll also lock in my rate, my interest rate, but I can renegotiate my rate in a few years yep. when they bottom out. I can't renegotiate my purchase price. Right. Which in my th- which in my estimation will be higher. Mm-hmm. So that's how I operate. Yeah. Uh, buy low, sell high. Yeah. All right. So what do you tell somebody who's like, I'm ready to kind of deploy in US or at least entertain the US? Is there like, how would you have done it if prior to us meeting? Like, how would you have gone? Oh, God, it? it's so painful. Ask for a referral. <laughs> find out <laughs> find out who's, uh, find out who's bought. Like, I, I, I'm a little bit different because I have a large network. Um, so, I, so I ask around, like, for referrals. What I find challenging, though, is that many, many people's bias is Florida. Right. My own due diligence, I don't have nothing against Florida. This is my own due diligence. Um, I've read too many, I have friends who got whacked in Cape Coral and Fort Myers. Uh, so now they're bag holding properties. It was, it's, it's really sad and, and unfortunate. They, like People were saying like, hurricanes never come here. Famous last words, right? It's like, it's uh, worst things always happen when you, when you say stuff like that. And then yeah, then they got, just, they got trashed by hurricanes. Mm-hmm. Right, so that, to me, that's too much risk for my for my profile, and also what I've read up on insurance is just um, not a fan of what I've read up, uh, how insurance rates are going up. So then, and then what I find is the other bias though is that people are a bit buying cross border, so they're going to Columbus, going to Detroit. Yeah. Right. You're choosing based on geography close to you. Yeah. It's not the it's not necessarily the right thing to do. So I really I don't really have a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. I, on I often, what I would do, it's hard. Yeah. I always find that the, the common path is, well, I happen to know an agent in this state that does rentals. And right. there's always somebody who specializes in their specific region. Um, and you can get diversification, again, within the same state. But um, I, I always try to convince them, I'm like, look, you need to look at the country as a whole. This is a massive country. It's not just like one agent knows the, the whole country. They specialize in their specific region. But why not weigh the regions against each other? Um, and even again within Atlanta or even Georgia, there are many awesome pockets to invest in. It's not just Atlanta. Um, so take a sort of grander, broader look at things uh, because there's still risk. Yes, you, you could drive there, but our goal is so you don't have to drive there. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could fly into one day and take off the next um, and then it's set it and forget it. Yeah, so then when, um, so what's your, I guess, your next steps now that you've kind of discovered us what how would you di- direct your clients and your network if they were saying hey i'm ready to go i've been telling them to uh <laughs> go to my go to our landing page www.iwin.sharesfr.com so they can see what properties are doing mm-hmm. like you can see past deals and all the numbers are there yeah actually a friend of mine a friend of mine who's already met with you and dimitri He's like, I like the performance because they have all the line items. Yeah. They don't leave things out that other people leave out. Yeah. He's an engineer, so he likes numbers. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, all the numbers are there. You can play with the down payment, what the size down payment, what the interest rates are. So for those who need to play with the interest rates, like rates are like over eight. Yeah. So that's so that's why my plan is to do like 40, 50% down. Right. Yeah. With, with cash, uh, uh, not debt bearing money. Um, so that'd be first thing to do and just to book a call with either yeah. myself or yourself yep. and they can do that from, from that site for, if they want to book a call with me and they know how to reach me and then just like 
go gangbusters on researching uh, real estate in the U.S. Yeah. Right. I've done a lot of ChatGPT. You know, I literally just like these are the economic fundamentals I'm looking for. Give me top. T- give me ten towns. Yeah. And it's the same names keep coming up. Yeah. Uh, North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, Denver, Colorado, Atlanta, Georgia, Texas, Dallas, Texas, um, Austin, Austin, uh, Texas, right? And then other markets come up as well. And then I, then I, I go digger, I go deeper. Like yeah. Houston came up, for example. And then when I dug further, like they have like double the flood risk. Double yeah. the, their insurance has doubled the national average. So like, oh, remove that, remove yeah. that. Or like, oh, this this area gets hurricane tornadoes. Remove that, right? Yep. So, did you um, get a lot of questions from the Tons. audience? Do you, did we address most of them? Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully, but you know, there's always tons of questions. I still have always questions, but yeah. um, I win. Dot sfr. Dot com. Answer your questions. Yeah. Oh, we had we had, we hosted a workshop. Yeah. That we sold way more than we ever thought. That was amazing. It was fun. Met a lot of great people. A lot of horror stories. It pains me when I hear that. Um, so you're doing them a service, or when you're you're like the real estate Robin Hood. You know, it, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Just uh, seeing people's eyes open because that's how I felt. Mm. The joke I've been sharing with you is like I felt I feel like I've been in the Matrix. Mm-hmm. Right. This is the best that we can do. Because we can't get financing out in the outside of outside of Canada, so let's make the best of what we the situation. What's the best thing we can do? Yeah, buy a house, buy a bungalow from the nineteen fifties, suite the basement. If you have the money, put on a garden suite for three hundred thousand dollars. That'll make it cash flow. Yeah, right. Now I'm into a million dollar property that won't even appraise properly. Right, because garden suites don't appraise. Right, like that's that's a ton. Yeah, that's a lot. That is a lot. Now, now, like then, I see these opportunities in the U.S. and like this is so much easier. No rent control, no LTB. The numbers are better, and it's scalable. Yeah, great financial products. Yeah, the financing is easier. Yeah. So the the only downside is it's further away. Yeah. <laughs> All right, which again isn't the worst thing. Yeah. And <laughs> like, we're typically in hot areas, so you know, take a trip. You know, drive the neighborhood if you'd like. A friend of mine is getting married in, in uh, just outside Calgary in February. I'm like, dude, like he, I know, he's like, I don't want to buy anything in Alberta. Can we just meet in Vegas? Because I know he has a plan trip to Vegas in yeah. April. Because I can, I'll look at properties in Vegas. I don't right. have any interest in looking at properties in Alberta. Right. But what do you say to those? That, you know, because Alberta is a, a, you know, is a pretty landlord friendly state, mm-hmm. right? I mm-hmm. mean, province. So American, but uh, yeah, why not? Why not go there? Because aren't the price points aligned with a lot of the U.S. real estate? Uh, Calgary's average price is six hundred thousand. Oh wow! Okay, I'm out of touch. Yeah, you're out of touch, bro. Wow. Here, here, here here's, here's a high level answer. My Alberta bull friends always tell me Alberta is the Texas of of, uh, of Canada. I, I say that to Can- Americans, right. but uh, yeah, I'm like, why don't I just go to Texas? Yeah, and I can get it for cheaper and better numbers. And then on the more detail side, like Calgary is on a is a complete seller's market now. It's on a bull run. Uh, it probably it'll probably bull run to like eight hundred thousand seller houses. Oh wow! Yeah, which is fine. Yeah, I kind of want to go to a buyer's market. Yeah, where yeah. I can get something for value. Yep. Right. And again, based on my based on my my study of the U.S. economy, here's another here's another way. Uh, I'm answering a question with a question. If you left North America and asked 100 people, can I pay you in Canadian dollars or U.S. dollars? What would you take? Yeah. Right? U.S. dollars. Would you find one person who would say, I'll take Canadian dollars over U.S. dollars? Right. Right? Would you even find a Canadian? You know, I bet you even ask Canadians. I bet a good number will say they take American dollars. Yeah. So the answer right there tells you you need to be earning something in American dollars. Yeah. Right? And then on the, on the, on the, on the bigger, on the bigger longer term um, planning is... I want options in life and I want options for my kids. Mm -hmm. So my plan would be to figure out how to get an E2 visa so that myself and my family can live in the States as long as we want. Should my kids ever want the option, should I ever want the option to live in the States? Right. Should my kids ever want the option to pursue career, pursue careers in the States and get paid 30 to a hundred percent more 
for the same job they do it in Canada and their housing would be a third of the cost yeah right so I'm just I think people know I'm, I'm a hyper overprotective parent so and I think all parents want want to, to have options for their kids so I'm no different yeah and so that's the path investing in, in Edmonton Calgary doesn't get me on that path right right yeah and, and, and it's already snowing in Calgary so <laughs> oh I'm a bad Canadian I can't handle the cold so. and that's another thing that you mentioned to me before as well is like demographically the states generally Americans are moving south yeah so that's why I, I was planning a road trip to Columbus Ohio for example so I've, I've shelved that because if the demographic trend is that people are moving south for better weather and, and no state taxes, yeah. <laughs> then that's where I want to be. Yeah. Right. I want all, I want many things as possible to align in my favor for a successful investment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Immigration is a more common theme in the U S people moving from state to state, not necessarily just staying in their home province and hometown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there's so much job creation and yeah. opportunity Else, in other places. Yeah, elsewhere, yeah. It's yeah. awesome time. It's, like, it's so crazy when I used to live in the States that I would get, when I'd get phone calls from my friends who are living in the same city as me, I'd get a million different area codes because they just didn't change their phone numbers. Mm -hmm. So I'd be looking like, Wisconsin, pick up the phone. It's like, oh, hey, it's like, are you coming upstairs or what? And I'm like, oh, you, I didn't realize you're from Wisconsin. But uh, yeah, that's how it's, it's pretty crazy. Like most people are not from where they're, they're living in places where they're not originally from. Mm -hmm. So you get, um, yeah, you got a lot of movement to go where the jobs go, right? And a lot of them move south. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anything we left out? I feel like we pretty much covered all of it. Yeah. Yeah, again, my diligence shows everything. I think the, the only other thing that, that uh, the only other risk factor that's higher in the States is vacancy is higher. Yes, vacancy is higher. Right. Because Americans can actually build housing. <laughs> it's, still, it's still behind schedule, still slower, but you know, rent. But compared to here? Yeah. They, there is a stat though, um, I don't remember right now, but rent, rental demand or growth is going to still outpace construction. Um, so there's still that. and. Even with a new build for rent, they're still leaving out a massive part of the market. I feel like those build for rents are very good for people who are just getting priced out of the market. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's still going to be rental demand. They're still going to still going to tick upwards, and the stats are showing that you know new supply is not coming in fast enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe not as aggressively as in Toronto, mm -hmm. but definitely still a, a national problem. Right, right. Yeah. So another thing, another thing that someone can do for to start out is I just went on Realtor.com. Mm -hmm. I chose an area that I was looking for. I was actually looking for comparables to properties that Sheriff's done, mm -hmm. and I just started like and I just researching rents and prices. Yeah, and then just to get familiarized with the, yourself with the area because it's just so different. Yeah, like um, like housing prices are coming down pretty fast compared to what I'm used to. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's a uh, much more of a buyer's market in even strong economic areas. Yeah, it's just. So, but again, like you guys have, have, prop, have accounted for vacancy allowance. Yes. Yeah. We'll by zip code, by region, yeah. typically dial it up or down, um, depending on that particular neighborhood. Cause we look at like over 300 data points per region we go into per mm -hmm. city, per zip code. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we take those into consideration of, for both repair, maintenance, age of home, vacancy, mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing I would, the, I know you don't like the analogy. <laughs> <laughs> the analogy for share that I always use is, I, if, I, if I, as a client of share, which I, which is where I, how I'm going to be acquiring my properties, mm -hmm. as I'm going to be doing through you guys, is I'm like a Costco member. Mm -hmm. I get to I get to benefit from, from your institutional buying power. Yeah, both insurance rates, your ability to get property. Uh, Property managers will talk to you, whereas they won't talk to me. Right, and I, and you'll negotiate my rates, so I get better rates. Yeah. Now, can you do it as? Can you get better investments if you did everything by yourself? You want to be a retail investor. You want to be hardcore. You want to be very active. Yes. Yeah. Six to nine months. Six to nine months. Yeah. Uh, I have a friend who's coming on the show. Uh, like he's looking for like a thirty percent return cash on cash on his U.S. investments, but it's highly active. Yeah. He's buying like pre-tax pre-tax sales. Yeah. And these are in towns you've probably never heard of, and he's got to find build a local team to execute it, yeah. right? To renovate it, hire find a realtor, 
all sorts of things, all doing it remotely, for looking for a thirty percent return, versus I'm looking for a leveraged twenty percent return. Yeah. Right. Well, I get to sit on my ass and just. Yeah. I look forward to meeting him after his first couple. <laughs> no, no, no. He's been doing it for years. Oh, has he? He's been okay. doing it for years. Okay, so he has a playbook. Yeah, he has a playbook. Okay. But also, like the things that people don't appreciate is like when people like there's there's court. I now someone there's someone in my feed now like selling doing a tax lien course. Um. So my friend has shared with me like the first three years were terrible. Mm. Right. Like that's beyond my appetite. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yep. I'm down for like two months vacancy, right. <laughs> two months carrying costs while it's yeah. being renovated. I'm down for that, <laughs> right? So. And you get the equity lift, you know. So you're not buying turnkey. You're getting all the yeah. you're getting all the bonus parts. Yeah, and I don't like to do much. Yeah, right? it's all factored in the pro forma. Yeah. So I'm expecting all these things. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, it's great. Anything else we're leaving out? I don't think so. Because uh, we still need to have you be back on part two for part two of your show. Because there's still many things we didn't cover. Okay. Um, like for example, that the, the uh, how tech has enabled you. Mm, okay. To make this business available to mom and pop investors. Because mm -hmm. I think people need to understand that is a lot of investment companies, if they want retail investors, they generally want higher net worth. And they're taking a percentage of the business. Yeah. Right. Which is one thing. I, which is one thing I like about Share is, I have direct ownership of the property. I own it one hundred percent, between me and the bank and my wife. And you, I can. You only charge me a fee. Yeah. I actually give this presentation to a room full of entrepreneurs. And real estate investors should understand this as well. Like, if you don't have to give up equity, like you don't. Yeah. You keep the pie to your hundred percent of the pie to yourself. Yep. You do bear all the risk, but also you you keep all the upside. Mm -hmm. I get to pay a fee for someone else to do all the heavy lifting. Yep. Like to me, that's a win. Yeah. Right. I know some people don't like it. <laughs> oh, I just manage it myself. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Try it. Yeah, I tell people like I get a lot of clients too. Like, oh, you know, I want to retire. I want these fees are high. I'm like, look, we're still cash flow positive on this time. Like, are you still working? Yes. When's your retirement? Ten years. So let us 10x your portfolio in those 10 years. And then when you're ready to retire, if you want to self-manage, fire us. But then when you realize you want, don't want to do the work, you can bring it back to us. You mm -hmm. know? So you, know, you could do the math on that. You could see what kind mm -hmm. of savings you get from firing us. But you know, by all means, go for it. But let us build your portfolio in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guarantee you when you want to retire, you're probably going to say, just keep going. Mm -hmm. but, and I think that's an important point. Yeah. Is the investor owns the asset. Yeah. The worst case is, because many people always ask me the worst case is, worst case, I have fire you guys, I hire a realtor and sell the property. Yep. That's my worst case. Yeah. Right? So it's the same worst case with any property I've ever experienced. Yeah. Except in, you know, the, my poor friends who've invested in Epic Alliance in Saskatoon, <laughs> there's no market for sale. Right. There's no market for resale. Oof. Right? They overpaid for property. They can't recover. Yeah. Versus... I'm buying based on economic fundamentals in an area I'd want to invest in. Mm -hmm. Strong job growth, growing incomes, growing immigration, right? And it maybe takes longer to sell than a property in around the Golden Horseshoe, right? But all the uh, everything else is just better. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you for watching. If you want to learn how to invest in real estate from scratch, my team teaches beginners how to use the number one investment strategy that I personally use in a virtual free training class every month. Go to investortraining.ca slash YouTube to register for our next class. The link is also in the description as well. I publish at least two to three videos a week here, so subscribe if you want to keep learning from seasoned investors like myself and my guests. And if you're just starting out, feel free to ask questions and comment below, and I do the best to answer each of the comments and questions myself. Again, if you're ready to learn the nitty gritty about real estate investing from a professional investor, register for our next virtual class. That's at investortraining.ca slash YouTube. Thanks again for watching. See you in the next video.